Do you want to get started? Uh, how about just another 30 seconds or so, Ken, because I'm seeing uh, our numbers are climbing with uh, the people joining our webinar. Okay, we'll wait then. All right. Amy, if I if I wanted to show a drawing or anything that would make sense, do I send that to you or am I going to be able to? You can share a screen. Okay. Amy, if I if I wanted to show a drawing or anything that would make sense, do I send that? Hmm. That was How about a recording of your voice. Yeah, I realized I had the YouTube um, live stream still on, so I have fixed that situation so we don't have an echo. Okay. That would throw right. you off a bit. <laughs> All right. Our uh, people joining the webinar are starting to die down. So we're at 103 people on the call, Tom and Ken, just so you're aware of that. So Ken, I'll, I'll turn things over to you to get started. Sure. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and I'm grateful to have uh, Tom Seekins here, who's the president of uh, uh, EMC, who's been our consultant uh, over the last several months, uh, trying to find solutions to our heating uh, problems within the elementary schools. Uh, today's uh, webinar is really designed for us to, one, put out a, uh, a, a outline of uh, the potential solutions to the heating problems within the elementary schools, but also to hear uh, from uh, our our support staff and our uh, and our teaching staff about some of the the problems that they have encountered with heating uh, over the last year or several years. Um, honestly, I just believe we're now in a crisis situation where we've had one uh, boiler go down and uh, at uh, mine it. Uh, and we have spent an enormous amount of money just to have heating stay into the system. Uh, so uh, we we want to make sure that one that the our staff are informed of what we're we're attempting to do, uh, and we also want to hear their concerns as well. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom, uh, so he can talk and give us just an overview of the work that his company has done and has briefed our operations subcommittee uh, and. Uh, so, Tom, thank you. Yes, I also have two engineers from EMC um, on the panel. Well, not on the panel, but uh, on the Zoom call as well. Eric Rodstrom and uh, Joe Griffin, who I think many of you met a few times at some of the subcommittee meetings Joe has attended. Um, Eric Rodstrom is an additional um, team member who has been doing a lot of uh, reviews of the drawings with Bennett Engineering and who's our partner on this project. So. Anything comes up that's uh, beyond my capacity, then those two can answer it, I'm sure. Um, but just to give an overview of the project, yes, we, we for several months now, we have been contracted to do an analysis of Minot Consolidated School, Elm Street, and Poland. Um, it's pretty obvious when we first got started that Minot really needed all the uh, most of the attention just because of the sheer fact that you have one boil at steam. It's been down already for a couple months and, and cost you a small fortune. Um, luckily, because of Joe Griffin, who was on the MC team, had worked uh, for Port City for a number of years and had um, built a steam boiler in a box. He knew of one that they had and was able to get them in touch with you guys so that they could get you uh, keep the school open and had a temporary boiler in place while they um, found a cast iron section. So that that became really the impetus behind this project was that you do have one steam single boiler. We have drawings for the drawings are now about 98 percent uh, complete. So I can show those drawings if anybody wants to see the technical aspect of the building and what the plan is for everything from uh, the boiler room to ventilation to the controls, so on and so forth. But um, as the district experienced cast iron sections are a, almost a thing of the past at this juncture. There's a couple companies still making them, but it was about 20 weeks to get a section to replace um, the broken section that was at Minot in the single boiler you had. And so that's what, that was the, really the big debacle of there was no heat. Um, so that's why you had to get the temporary boiler in place, uh, extremely expensive. But with a boiler, regardless of its age, that's a cast iron sectional boiler. And when you only have one, 
when you lose a section, it's not if you lose another section, it's just when. So that's why this became, you know, the eminent, all right, this is something we need to focus on now. If there's any project that needs to get done this summer, it's going to have to be uh, mine at Consolidated School. And uh, while Elm Street and, and Portland, Poland are obviously important as well, because you have one boiler and the majority of the school has, you know, really no mechanical ventilation in place, mine at school became the obvious um, and biggest need for the district. So um, we we got together with Bennett Engineering and the EMC team. We started pawing through the building, making sure that we had all the infrastructure um, knowledge that we needed to have. So from the electrical aspect of things to, to verify whether or not a heat pump or a VRF system would make sense to go electrification versus a thermal or fossil fuel solution. Efficiency Maine does have incentives for that. Uh, however, three-phase power is about two miles away and we checked with CMP um, to confirm that it would be a little over half a million dollars to bring, to bring three-phase power to that school. So that in conjunction with the need to upgrade the electrical service at the school, that was a bit contradictory to um, the incentive that Efficiency Maine could offer. So if the incentive was between one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 based on your square footage of 33,200 square feet in that building, it really didn't make sense to bring the power there to accommodate the VRF or heat pump system. So back to the, um, the boiler room and, and just really almost a traditional type ventilation system with three mechanical uh, ERVs, energy recovering ventilators, outside of the building. Um, so there'd be nothing on the roof. Um, the boiler room would have full redundancy. It'd be a Wiesman um, liquid propane condensing boiler rack mounted solution. Um, you would have a non-proprietary building automation controls throughout the facility so that you could start to build a platform that would connect to the other schools eventually. Um, so that you could see your facility structure and, and other personnel that were uh, that were permitted would have access to the automation system for the whole district. Um, and then every space would have mechanical ventilation based on ASHRAE 62.1 standards for um, a typical classroom um, that you'd have. So everything is going to be done, obviously, per state of main code and compliance. Uh, we've gone through several different renditions of this, as, as your subcommittees can tell you and attest to. And uh, this final design we have, we feel has, it meets everything that the district really needs in terms of adequate ventilation and heat and temperature control, redundancy in the boiler plant, which you don't have today, and the most efficient system you can get based on the infrastructure that you have in place. So, you know, reusing inside air when you can, uh, making sure it's healthy quality air, um, uh, automating it so that things um, can fluctuate based on CO2 levels in the spaces so that you will ventilate based on uh, parts per million of CO2. So it's extremely healthy and safe. Uh, and that's the most efficient way of doing it as well. So that's kind of like a broad overview of the, the final um, solution that we came up with. And that once, once we have this final um, decision, we'll then get the contractors through the building We'll hold a, a, um, a bid, a, a bid meeting, a pre-bid meeting, and uh, the MC team and Bennett Engineering combined will walk through the prospective contractors. We have three contractors, very quality, high quality uh, mechanical contractors that are willing to bid on this so that we've, we've been telling them about this for several months, because as most know, mechanical contractors right now are hard to get um, to get projects done for the summer. So we are ready to um, get them through and, and get the competitive bids and, and roll that out to the district and, and uh, make a recommendation for the summer. Hopefully that's a good synopsis. Thank you, Tom. Uh, no, one of the, the complications we have, we've had a lot of this planning going on and thank God that uh, Tom com company company Tom's company was available. Uh, we've gotten a lot enormous amount of work done in a very short period of time. Uh, as you all know, we've had heating problems for years in all of these uh, elderly aging uh, uh, buildings. Um, it is now time to fix them, and we are at, uh, in my opinion, a crisis. Uh, it's certainly at least in one uh, and possibly two buildings, uh, but that means we have to find a funding source for it. 
uh, and we are now in a so, somewhat of a dilemma on finding that funding. Uh, we can, we we cannot, in my opinion, wait till our regular budget uh, time frame to to uh, try to find the funding to fix it. Uh, we have to find a, an alternative to that. So, um, but I'd like to see if people have some uh, uh, questions for Tom and uh, and for me and Amy, uh, and uh, and see if we can answer them. Uh, uh, as best we can, uh, and then uh, uh, we'll go from there. But it's, this is more informational for you, and also we want to hear your 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 uh, questions, concerns, uh, and uh, so we at least we're informed uh, about uh, where the staff uh, sits on our heating problems. Yeah, I think we really want all of you to understand that we we know the impact that it's had on you and we do want to hear those stories and hear those questions, but we also want you to have a seat at the table because as we move forward fixing this, this impacts you, number one, potentially as taxpayers in our three two our three communities, but also to the, the climate of your classroom. And uh, if you have any questions or would like to speak about you, the impact it's had on you, you can use your raise hand icon, and then uh, I'll bring you forward as a panelist. And if you can make sure that your first and last name is displayed. And our, although we welcome uh, community members today, our intent of our webinar was for our staff because we first really wanna talk about this with our staff to get your perspective and your understanding. And then we grow it out to our community members. We did invite our school board and our our, our town administrators or town managers. And then uh, if you do have some questions that are left unanswered in our time, then you can definitely email them to Ken and I and we'll loop Tom in to find those answers. And also too, maybe if you're not feeling comfortable with sharing your story today or sharing uh, you know, how it's impacted you, uh, we are looking for some short statements to be able to publish in our community updates. So that way our, our, our towns understand the impact that this has had on you as a teacher and educator in our district. So I'll stop there and start beginning looking for some hands. I also have dropped in the chat to the, um, from EMC, from Tom, the the breakdown for each building as to how we would go about the plan for each fixing each heating system. Um, I do see someone whose name is, um, their name is not displayed and it's a nickname that I do not recognize. Um, so if that person who has their hand up, not you, Denise, <laughs> um, it says isolate four, if you could rename yourself or shoot me an email, that way I can know who that is. So that way we're focusing just on our staff today. And does Denise have a ability to show us her face? There we go. I can talk to. <laughs> um, so I I think I have kind of a unique experience here at Minot Community School. Um, last year, I was down in a kindergarten room towards the middle of the building where there was absolutely no heat. Um, it was at one day we were right around 61. Um, I had space heaters going, but there was no way to heat a classroom. Um, so that it was comfortable. My students would come in with jackets. I was wearing Under Armour sweaters and a jacket um, in the classroom. So that is, that just for the whole span of the winter months, um, put another level of stress at, and that sort of thing on uh, onto myself and the other two teachers in the room, the other interventionists in the room. Um, people, we were wearing hats and mittens. So that's one perspective from last year. This year, I've moved to the book room where I walk in and have to immediately open windows every single day because it's like a sauna in here. I don't know what the temperature is, but it's very, very uncomfortable and dry. I brought in my own um, little humidifier so that I can get some moisture in the air. Um, like I said, I'm opening the windows, which is just, it's kind of, you know, we're losing energy basically by me doing that. Um, so that's another side of it. Um, the heat, as you all know, makes it, makes people groggy and it's very hard for my students. 
um, when it's that hot. And if I have the window open, the window, the wind is blowing in and um, where it's cold outside, they find that uncomfortable too. So again, it, it's just, it's more of a um, additional stressor or another thing you have to deal with basically um, to uh, work comfortably in your environment. Thank you, Denise. We know that opening the window is kind of uh, intuitive to yeah. what's supposed to happen. So yes. thank you. Yep. I think Wendy's next and she's on the screen. Well, it was just to bounce off of Denise as I'm in the classroom across the hall from where she was and my room will be 80, 90 degrees with the windows open in the old crank style. So if it's not, doesn't always let the heat in because of the way it's styled. So, I mean, they'll be freezing across the hallway and I'm at 90, 80, 90 degrees with windows open and sometimes fans going to kind of move that air around. So, um, so what kind of impact does it have on your students? For, it, it's, it's warm. We're sluggish. You know, we're taking off, you know, sweaters. We're taking off jackets, whatever we can. I've got the windows open to try to move the air. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's warm. When you walk in, you go, wow, it's warm. It's dry, nosebleeds, yeah. um, the dry cracked lips. So, yeah. And of course, you've gone from that extreme to uh, earlier this year in the fall being extremely cold because we didn't have a heating system up. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. We were wearing jackets, hats, mittens to kind of keep ourselves um, warm with the, <clears throat> with the little space heater and whatever else. So yeah. Okay. So Ken, I heard you saying before, because we've had two minor uh, people speak about the path forward. And so what could be next? I heard Tom saying that we need to get going with the lining up the contractors and ordering the parts. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, do contractors do that before we say we have the money for this? And, and is there a ballpark estimate that we have to be able to fix each building? And, and how do we how do we move forward so that when our our Minot Mustangs return next year, uh, that the heating is potentially all taken care of. Yeah, uh, the, the the process forward is 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 establishing uh, financing. Okay, uh, it does not it cannot come through our regular budget process. It's going to cost in excess of five million dollars to deal with all three schools. Uh, and nearly two million dollars to deal with mine it, okay? Uh, and that's uh, that's based on just current uh, estimates. Uh, what we have to do is we have to have a bond. Uh, and for a bond to go through, we have to have uh, a 16 day notice for a referendum for bond. Uh, and it, quite honestly, uh, for us to be able to accomplish the mine it uh, 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 project, uh, this summer, we have to have that done uh, in the spring. Uh, we have to have a, a referendum, uh, pr uh, presumably approving uh, the uh, the bond. Uh, once we get the approval done and a referendum, then we can do what they call it is a band, uh, a bond um, anticipation notice, where we will actually borrow money from probably one of the local banks. We did this with the middle school extension, uh, and that gives us uh, financial resources to be able to put towards purchasing equipment, getting it here in time, uh, and, and guaranteeing the, uh, the, the, um, the, the project for our contractors. Uh, without that, uh, contractors are just not going to be able to uh, be willing to be able to commit to it. Uh, so we need to do something sooner than what we have coming up. Uh, a real dilemma, of course, is that uh, uh, the, the towns have indicated to us uh, recently that doing more than one bond, or one uh, referendum a year is, is virtually uh, impossible or difficult for them. So we have... We, we're, we have a bit of a dilemma, and maybe some of you guys can give me some suggestions and recommendations on how to go forward. But right, right now, I think uh, Minot is the priority. Uh, the other two, hopefully, will be uh, we can get funding for them and get them done next summer. Um, but uh, uh, it's it's fairly important. Uh, but it has to go through a, a bond, uh, a referendum uh, to get the bond approved and then we have the ability to to uh, use a get a ban and get local money for us to be able to fund it tom do you want to add to that yeah um yeah all that is we've we've been through that process several times and, and been part of using a ban um to get a project going 
You're exactly right. So once we get the contractors through there, it takes a f- you know several weeks for them to get back to us with pricing. Uh, we have verified with the ventilation manufacturers and of course the boiler room and all the other parts and pieces that we need in place. And ventilation equipment is about 10 or 11 weeks out similar for the boilers, which were 20 weeks, but that's gotten better. Um, Viesman has actually caught up domestically, so that's gotten better, which is great. But that being said, there's no way you could wait um, even until April to say, go ahead with a project that just would never get it done in time. You're talking about a complete steam to hot water conversion in this building. So you're going to be taking apart all of the ceilings and running new hot water pipe and ductwork through those ceilings to bring in ventilation that does not exist today and rip out all the, uh, the, the you're going to gut the entire steam boiler. Um, and it's going to be a whole new hydronic heating plant. There's a considerable amount of work that needs to be done in a short amount of time. So uh, the design is ready to go, and we've got contractors ready to walk the building and provide bids. But once you have selected a contractor, because we will show all the bids, we'll show you the numbers and make recommendations, uh, that contractor would then order the equipment. If if the, um, if the for some reason, the referendum didn't pass. There's no way, as you said, the contractor would be willing to hold on to that equipment because these air handlers are are big. Some of them, um, a couple of them are 15 feet long and other ones 20 feet long. I mean, they're big, you know? And there's only three that are gonna ventilate that entire building. So there's no way they're just gonna keep them on hold. They're very specific to your use. Um, So they would wanna know that there's funding in place that you could buy that equipment if for some reason the referendum shouldn't pass. you know, that way they could at least get that out from underneath of them in a place to store that equipment until it was passed or you used a different financing vehicle. Uh, that's about all I can, I can add to it, I think. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that right now we have our June referendum, which our, our voters go to the polls and they will, they'll d- just cast their votes on the the district budget and we had asked for that to be earlier but that is when we we discovered that the best choice for our our towns is to to not have it earlier but to have it in june but now i'm hearing you say that in order for us to get the work completed at mine it for the next school year we need to have a referendum sooner in order to uh pass this bond Oh, yeah. June, you'd be way behind. There's no way you'd get. I mean, like I said, every ceiling tile is going to be removed in those hallways so that you can run the pipe through the building um, inside and outside. You're going to and it'll get done. We've done bigger projects that are they're far more invasive, but it's pretty darn invasive. So, you know, it's basically the whole heating and ventilation system is going to be replaced. Um, so it, there's a lot of prep work that needs to go on this. It's quite a project to actually get it done. But there's there's a couple months, several months of just preparing and getting the the equipment in place and ready to go for contractors to execute this work. And if that can't happen, Tom, if we had to wait for the June referendum, then we risk being having to put off the mine at work for next summer uh, would be would be the next best case scenario. And then putting off the Elm Street and PCS even a year out from from that. Yeah, as you've already experienced, it's again, it's not it's not if you use an, lose another section and you lose a section of that boiler, your whole boiler plant goes down. So you have no heat in the entire facility. So you have one, that one steam boiler that is on its last legs. Um, you've seen it and have experienced it. So if you lose another one, when you lose another one, it's going to go down again. And then you have no other option. You don't have capacity to implement a new boiler next to that one because it's steam, right? So you're not going to put in a steam cast iron section boiler that's just really not even being made anymore. Um, it really, there's no other option. This is, you're you're very much stuck with this situation. Um, and you've got a plan in place. You've started talking about this several months ago. We've been looking at this building for months and it is taking several renditions to get to the right system that would make sense that we could execute um, this summer. So the, the proper planning has been done. We've been doing it and it's ready to go. It's just a matter of, you really can't wait until June to make this decision. There's just no way you'll get the project done. Okay. Cindy, you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> Thank you. So I can reiterate what the other my colleagues have said from my building and that these classrooms are horrendously hot and the impact on children is tremendous. They don't know how to dress on a daily basis to be comfortable in the classroom. I'll open one window because it is like, 
working in Florida um, and it'll cool down a portion of the classroom, but then that portion of the classroom being main will get cold for, and I have to try to regulate the heat by opening and closing the windows throughout the day. And it doesn't seem like there's any happy medium. Um, you know, they, I can tell them to dress, dress light, but what parent wants to dress their child light when it's January. Um, so it has definitely impacted. And this has not just been a one year deal. Um, right. Please, please know that this is something that I have been dealing with, I would say for probably 10 years, the heat in this particular area of the building, I'd say the oldest section of the building is probably um, the section of the building that is most impacted. I understand that the steam pipes first travel through my classroom. Um, that's the, that's the first stop on its, um, travels through the building and so my room is horrible that way um so just speaking to what ken said about the bond um you said that the mine it project is a two million dollar project and it, there is some concern about whether or not that would pass in my mind um one of my worries is if you put that bond out to the three towns um, that sometimes we're more worried about ourselves in our own little towns than yep. we are worried about not my town, not my problem. Um, right. And I like to think that our district has moved beyond that. It's been a long time. It's, I don't know how many years we've been in RSU. I would like to think we've moved beyond that. Um, but is it feasible to ask for a larger amount for all of the projects to be done. And so everybody can see that the money, the increase in their tax dollars is going to serve their own town and own community. So, so to answer your question, Cindy, yes, it is possible. Um, and uh, I, I have to admit that I thought maybe that could be a potential as well. I take care of my school and then not anybody else's. We could put a bond in there that it covers all three anticipated costs. Uh, and we would prioritize at that time the neediest school, which we have already said is mine it. Uh, and then we would be able to program the other two schools uh, when equipment and contractors were available. We could certainly do that. Um, but, uh, you know, we're we're this is why we're asking you guys what you, what your thoughts are. Uh, I think that's a prude. I think that's very prudent because that way everybody feels like it's a collective gain for right. their money. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Karen, you're next. Hello, all. Um, I am also at mine at school. I'm right across from Cindy Levesque. And without simply piggybacking on them, one question I heard was the impact of children. And I want to say first that when we lost the heat, we sent notices home to families, please send sweatshirts. And before all of my families were used to sending sweatshirts, we were living in t-shirts because it is so hot and uncomfortable. Um, and they really don't, as Cindy said, don't know how to dress. Um, but more recently in these days where the heat, our temporary heat, thank you for getting it fixed so quickly. Um, our temporary heat can cause, uh, four or five friends to tell me they have headaches midday and they want to go see the nurse because they have a headache from the heat. Mm -hmm. Um, again, the windows are open to get, you know, flow of air and our, our anchor charts are blowing around and papers are landing on the floor. Um, children are getting up to leave the room for water and bathroom breaks a lot more often. So there's a lot of lost education time because of the water drinking and the headaches and the bathroom breaks. And, and it is hard for them to focus on their learning with such a different um, fluctuate in heat. So I, I do support any changes and hope that we can get it rolling. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Mary, Thank you. you're next. 
Um, being a resident of Poland, as well as the school nurse here at Minot, I can tell you all three of these buildings have limped along for years now. Uh, one question I had was, um, it said we that the other two school have the three phase um, electrical. And it sounds like this new plan, we would not have that here at Minot. Is that still something that's on the back burner that needs to be done or? No, and because of the, the extravagant cost to move it towards right. the school, it's over a half million dollars. So the plan would not be for that. Our, our most um, uh, cost-effective solution is go with the existing phase power that we have right now and improve on the internal systems that we have. Okay. And right now we are number 37 on the list for replacing schools, I think is what I saw. Is that... That, that list, this, does that, that move us? Somewhere? No, that list doesn't move. Uh, they haven't funded uh, new schools for several years. What'll end up happening is when we uh, when we uh, have an op, they have an opportunity more funding. We will then apply again. Well, the problem, of course, is mine. It was applied for solely the last time. Uh, uh, my advice, uh, it'll happen to my replacement, is if money comes open for new schools. Uh, that we have, we uh, put all three schools in, uh, and then we're more likely to get funding because although you may be the worst shape school, the other schools are in pretty good, uh, pretty bad shape too. So putting them all together, but also Mary, you got to understand that will be a controversy from some of our some of our staff and our community because they enjoy their small elementary schools, and what we're talking about right now is the cost of keeping small elementary schools is the facilities, the maintenance and the upkeep. So, right. okay. which I, I would rather keep that. I agree with Cindy that if we have present, everybody has a piece of the pie to get um, their school fixed, it yeah. would probably go better. Um, my other question is, is if you get into this and you find other problems, what happens to our beginning of the school year? Because we had a really rough start the last three school years. Yeah, I'm well, we, we would have to see what the problems are, Mary. Uh, and having worked with projects before uh, and having a deadline at the beginning of school, somehow they always seem to make it work, okay? Uh, they know that the, the high priority school has to start on time. Uh, and if not, we'll delay it a little bit if we need to. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, remember we started the school year without the front office done. So I, I get that. Are you, but you, have, but you know what, Mary, you have a new front office. Other people don't. Yeah. So. No, I know. I'm what I'm just saying is what is the plan if that occurs? Yeah, we'll we'll have to play it by ear uh, and and hope that we'll get all the things we need for the. But the good thing is, it's a heating system we're putting in. Uh, we may very well still be able to have school in September uh, without heat. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and and Mary too. You know, we're that's why it's important to get competitive numbers, but it's really important not to just to take a low bid number. And a low bid number, a lot of times, does not account for things like you're talking about. So we will yeah. have. Um, vetted out, which we already have, the contractors that would bid on this project. This is not a project that you would want someone to kind of cut their teeth on. This is a project that you want someone that's done this, these same projects for 30 something years. And that's what these contractors will be. Um, so whichever one is chosen based on their price and their capabilities of getting it done, they will have experienced whatever issues that you can anticipate for this project. So, and um, quickly, the, the power is not an issue. The reason I brought it up was just to let folks know in the community that it was a very strong desire for the district to take advantages of much free money that they could. And that would be the funding opportunity notice that um, Efficiency Maine put out there about electrification of heat. And so that's why I spent the time to talk about the single phase power aspect so that people knew that it wasn't just let's go with the most expensive option out there. That is absolutely not the case. We tried to go after as much free money as we could. But when you you heard the math, like I said, to get a two hundred thousand dollar max incentive, spending six hundred thousand to get it, it makes no sense. But single phase power is used widely, and it's not a big issue at all. The other buildings, Elm Street and um, Poland Community, you will have the capability to to use a different type of heating plant there, just based on the um, the electrical aspect. Right, because they're more in a central town. Okay. Well, they That's have three phase power, right? Yeah, and yeah. and yeah, 
Yep. Okay, Thank Mary. you. Thank you, Mary. I don't know who was first, whether it was Jody or Daniela. <laughs> who was that, it, Amy? It was Jody, but I also do want to recognize that we said our webinar would end at 3.15 and it is 3.20. We're going to continue on with, with questions and answers. It is being streamed live to YouTube and we'll post the the, the, the link if uh, uh, some of our staff need to, to go in and do their, their next step here from, uh, from 3.15 on. But Jody was up next. Okay. Mary kind of stole my question. Um, I was wondering as well, like, when do we start looking at building brand new buildings? Because it seems like $5 million is a lot to dump into just heating. Mm -hmm. I understand it needs to be done. I'm not disagreeing with that, but that's a lot of money. And at what point, you know, I look at our leaky roof and the tubes we've got coming out of the ceilings and all the other stuff that's going on that probably needs to be fixed and not just PCS, but all the buildings. And um, at what point do we start thinking about, hey, maybe it's time to build new? Yeah, it's interesting. You 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 pluralized buildings, okay? So the, your, your, your premise is that we would build three different, I assume for each community who would still want their small elementary school. Uh, that would be uh, not something the state would probably endorse. What they do is they like to consolidate. So if we have a need for all three buildings to be replaced and we're part of an RSU, what they would end up doing is they probably would fund uh, a, a larger elementary school that would house all of our students. Um, and or uh, the other element, of course, is if each community says, I still want it, uh, then maybe what they do is they, they fund the whole project themselves. But that's really, really expensive. You know, you're talking... You know, I, I think Edward Little High School is what, 120 or 30 million dollars. Uh, and that's just for one. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we I would love to be able to say, let's build new schools or a new school. But we won't have to compete with the state funding. Uh, we were very fortunate when when the high school and middle school were built. That was uh, virtually completely funded by the the, the state. Uh, I, I, I think that if we combined all three schools, we could actually probably get something similar to that, but they don't have any funding right now. So, yeah. So in the, in, if we have to put money like this into the buildings, the good thing is even if we were to consolidate and build a new building, what would happen is these buildings would be preserved for many, many years. Uh, and what, uh, by law, what we would have to do is we would have to offer them to the towns for their own use. Uh, and then that the buildings would not cost the towns anything. They would just assume responsibility for them and their maintenance. So they could put their town offices, they could have their rec basketball, they could up all those things. That's what happens to the buildings. They're offered to the municipalities that they're in. So uh, I think the investment in, in these buildings keeps our kids warm when they need to be. Uh, keeps our staff warm when they need to be, but we also then have the ability, uh, because we've preserved them to make them longer, uh, they would be able to be turned over to the town for their use. Did that answer your question? <clears throat> Thank you. Daniela. Hey, um, so I'm here with Cheryl. Probably gonna hate me for saying that, but I did it anyways. Um, <laughs> we're wondering about the bond and looking at the $2 million bond and the potential $3 million bond. So my question for you is the monetary impact a $5 million bond would have and how long would that last? And the monetary impact a $2 million bond would have and how long it would be? And when would that overlap start for a $3 million um, bond and what monetary impact um, would we have from that? So. I'm going to add okay. more. To this. And so so if, if, we, if we were to yeah. simply bond the first project, what we've anticipated is about $225,000 a year for 20 years. Okay, uh, so, so if you, if you think about uh, doubling or tripling that, okay, that then you're talking about 600, you know, $700,000 over a 20 year period to pay for those. Okay. So what is your suggestion? Do you think that we should be looking at doing a $5 million bond and getting over with now? Is there is there a bonus to that? Or is there a perk to that in the investment kind of monetary aspect of that? Or is it best to stagger it? Because we can limp along 
potentially, at least the two schools from what Tom was saying, we could limp along for a little bit, but how long are we going to be limping along for? Are you saying a year, a two year? Like what is that limp along plan for the other yeah. two? My, my ideal situation is, is you asked me what my recommendation is. Uh, I want whatever we send out passes. It has to pass That's in great. all three communities, okay? And people mm-hmm. got to remember that. This isn't just minded people voting on something. It's Poland in Mechanic Falls. Mm-hmm. I want something that everybody will be able to approve because if it's not improve, approved, then it have to go another year and, and wait for it and limp along for another year. So uh, my uh, if, if it was up to Ken Healy, uh, I would ask for all three of them uh, to be approved at the same time, because yeah. Ken Healy's leaving at the end of the year, and they will have then established funding to be able to improve all three schools uh, yeah. and, and heating as best they, they can. But I also know that we have a crisis in Minot that is greater, although we have a crisis in the other two schools, it's greater there. Uh, I want at least something that will be able to pass the voters I and, definitely recognize the crisis in Minot, and I appreciate that. And I do apologize for what Minot is going through, but I do, I, I do worry about sending out a two bonds versus one bond, just for the fact that we have had things voted down that other towns have wanted or needed, potentially. And yeah. I worry about that, and I really want people to be thinking about that and considering that. And then. Um, if you do decide to go with one bond or two bonds, what do you need from us as, as teachers to help um, promote promote it? Um, so I, I guess that's where so, I'm at. I am worried about two, two so bonds. You hit it right on the nail. You need to promote it. You need to promote it with your community, with your with your, your community members, your, your parents, everybody you know. Uh, they need to know the impact it's having on you and your, your students. And, your, and and you heard Cindy early. She's had problems at least 10 <laughs> years in her classroom. And all so haven't you. Uh, and we've been able to band-aid it and fix it. Uh, and now we're at a place where they need to be replaced. So that's what I would need from you is support of whatever we bring forward uh, and, and really make sure that people understand the negative impact it's having on t- uh, teaching and learning. Uh, so... Okay. And Thank Kenneth, I, I can touch on Daniela's comments about the how long. Um, the Elm Street School is really bad. I, I the one of the meetings we did, we actually did a field trip and had the folks from the committee go down to the boiler room and and most couldn't stand to be in there because it was literally over 150 degrees. So there's significant steam leaks in that building in the boiler room, um, a lot of code compliance issues. The 50s wing is it's three times its life expectancy for the ventilation equipment that's been in there. So, you know, ASHRAE standards around 20 years for the, that type of ventilation equipment that's there. It's literally 64 years old, 66 years old. Um, so more than three times its life expectancy. So that building is equally as important. And Poland's right behind it with 33-year-old equipment, right? And so it's well beyond its life as well. It would just became an issue of what can actually get done logistically this summer um, in Minot, having just one steam boiler that's already on its last legs, it became the, uh, you know, the most important one to get done right now. But you needed a little bit more time, in our opinion, to get get Elm Street done the right way. Take the right take the right amount of time to plan it. Get the most efficient equipment you get in there. Garner the most free money you can through Efficiency Maine. And by waiting until next year for that one, that allowed you to do that. Yeah. So, so, so you know, yeah. if we went out for a bond for all three projects. We have three years from the time the bond is, is is purchased to expend the money. So we would be able to do it if we did it in one. Yeah. So so what you also need to do is you also need to um, have whatever influence you can on on all of the people that uh, make decisions in our three communities. And I think too, Daniela, you know, Cindy said it best and it does, it acknowledges the needs in all three of our, our communities. And I do hear like, when is it time? Do we just start thinking about building new buildings? But we also want to we want to have that support. And so like the need is the biggest factor right now. And we don't want the politics to be the factor because we do run that risk of, you know, I think it was Cindy who said it best as to it's not my town, not my problem, but it is, these are our kids because they all walk across our graduation stage. So we have, if we're going to keep our three little elementary schools, then we need to make sure that they are functional and safe and healthy for our staff and our students. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Darren, you may be the last one. Bring us home. 
All right. Well, I'm I'm a big proponent of Ken Healy Elementary School being built or whatever we want to call it. <laughs> um, but that's probably more than we want to bite off right now. Absolutely. Uh, you don't want to do that. Okay. Uh, I mean, I teach at Minot Consolidated School in Elm Street both and, and can verify the heating issues that I deal with in the gymnasium uh, in both buildings and ventilation uh, in both buildings. Uh, and I guess I would say I think going with one big bond, asking for that, I think that pulls all three communities together to feel like they, you know, you don't have the people from Mechanic Falls and Poland saying, hey, we're voting on a bond that's only helping the school that's over and mine it. It makes them feel like we're voting on a bond. And yes, we're not going to get our work done this summer, but we'll get it done next summer. And it makes sure that our our schools get taken care of mm -hmm. uh, and and don't get pushed off maybe further and further because we've voted on this right now uh, and kind of locked it in. Uh, right. So I think that would be to our advantage uh, to frame it that way, uh, to bring and you know kind of make it inclusive that all three school buildings are going to get their needs met. Um, and have really much more efficient heating and ventilation systems, which would be a great thing yeah. uh, for our kids and for our staff uh, and for our three towns. Yeah. Because, you know, 10 years from now, maybe we do build a new elementary school. And at least at that point, we would have really strong heating ventilation systems in the buildings that we would be handing off to the towns at that point if a new school was built and not handing them something that has, you know, a 55-year-old boiler in it. So. Yeah. That would be my, I, I would be a big proponent of that. Yeah. Having been in a school district where we had two schools that were closed and no, when we tried to turn them over to the towns, the towns didn't want them because of the heating problems. Uh, literally, we had to sell them uh, to uh, outside and we got very little money for them. Uh, but we also didn't have the burden for caring for them after that. So. Yeah, I, I think it's really important, uh, you know, especially as our next step is probably to have a community forum like this. Uh, I would invite all of our, uh, our staff to come to that for them to be able to even repeat some of the things so the community members can hear from their viewpoint uh, the impact it's having on teaching and learning. Uh, so. Yeah, and if, if, if you didn't get a chance to speak today or you did and you want to type that up, so that's something that Ken and I can use in our community update, we would love to have that be part of our next piece because hearing your story is really important. And um, I forgot what I was going to say next. So, Thanks, Darren. <laughs> yes, thank you, Darren. Okay. Any last thoughts before we uh, come to a close? Tom? Okay. Amy? Okay, well, th thank you all very much for coming this afternoon. I really appreciate it. This is this is a, a, not first step. This is probably about the 15th step of probably a 30 step process to get it accomplished. So uh, thank you. And I look forward to one, your, 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 your thoughts on it and also your support. So thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon.